Hey, Micro Church. Hope you guys are having a great week. This week, we're going to continue in our series going through the Gospel of Mark together. Uh, and we're still going to be in Mark chapter 1. And so far, in this very uh, brief but rich introduction uh, that Mark gives us on the person and the work of Jesus Christ, we've learned two things. We learn one, that the Gospel changes everything. Uh, it changes every aspect of our lives. The good news that Mark is introducing us to literally changes our lives from the inside out if we let it, right? And it invades us and it changes us and it restores us and it makes us new. So it changes everything. We've also learned that Jesus is with us and for us, right? Jesus can identify with us all the way down to the lowest level of humility when he was baptized by John in the Jordan. But he's also completely unlike us in the fact that he is the Son of God. He is God in flesh, Emmanuel. And both of these aspects of Jesus are truth. Both of these realities show us, right, that Jesus is with us and he is for us, that he loves us. And so, so today we're going to look at Mark chapter 1, verses 14 through 20. This is what Mark says. It says, Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee, proclaiming the gospel of God. And saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Then passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in the boat, mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with their hired servants, and they followed him. All right. So after, after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee preaching and proclaiming the good news of God, right? The kingdom of God is at hand. And, and we'll, we'll get to that good news here in a minute. But I want to point out that Mark makes mention here that Jesus waited until John was arrested to begin his ministry. Right? If you remember, John the Baptist was the one that came to prepare the way of the Lord, that came to uh, make his paths straight. Right, But just because our paths are straight and clear, it doesn't mean that, that the roads are easy to travel always. And we will see that as we continue out the gospel of Mark uh, in the life and ministry of Jesus. But this correlation of John's arrest and, and Jesus' beginning of ministry, it's important. Uh, Mark includes it for a reason, and he includes it to show us that the gospel, right, this good news, is actually known best in adversity and suffering, right? The gospel does its best work in our pain and our suffering. The gospel does its best work in adversity because it's there that we begin to truly understand and truly know it more, right? It's there that we, we see how it enters into our hurts, it enters into our pain, it enters into our guilt and our shame, and it offers us healing from the inside out. But John the Baptist, his, his whole life's purpose was to prepare the way for the Messiah. All of it, right? That was John's purpose. Not just the message that he proclaimed in the wilderness, but his whole life, his arrest, his suffering, and even his death. It was part of the preparing of the way for the Messiah, for Jesus Christ, to come in his life, and his message, and his death are all prepared because of John's, right? And it's because of this adversity, it's because of this suffering that the gospel is able to be proclaimed and understood, right? It's through these seasons of life that we can find the hope that one day, right, one day all things will be made new. And, and that is the message that Jesus actually came to proclaim, right? That is the gospel of God, the good news. Jesus said the time is fulfilled in the kingdom of God is at hand. See, everything that has happened throughout history, everything that has happened up to this point in time and up to this point in scriptures, from the creation account, the exodus, to the building and destruction and rebuilding of the temple, and all the different exiles, everything has been leading up to this very moment in time, right? To the message of Jesus Christ. That time is now. Right, you see, the, the people of Israel, they've been waiting. They, they haven't heard from God in close to 400 years. They haven't heard from God since, since Malachi. And, and now we see God in flesh coming down 
from heaven to earth and announcing that the time has come, right? That the waiting is over and that the kingdom of God is now at hand. See, here's what we know. History is full of moments that are chaotic, right? It's full of war. It's full of hatred. It's full of rebellion. It's full, it's full of divisiveness. It's full of all kinds of evil, all kinds of disease, all kinds of famine and poverty. And the list can go on and on and on and on. Right, we're living in one of those chaotic times now. But Jesus came to make the announcement that everything was going to be made new, that all the wrongs were going to be made right. Right? That or or in the words of, of the great Samwise Gamgee, right, that everything sad will become untrue. He came to announce that the time has come and that the kingdom of God is at hand. Right? He came to tell people that God is sovereign. And that no one and no thing can stop his kingdom from coming to earth as it is in heaven. Nothing can stand in its way. God's will will be done. Period. Right? No president, no nation, no evil, no rebellion. Nothing will stop his will. This is the message that Jesus was proclaiming. This is the good news. This is the truth. Right, that he was telling everyone. But the question that we have to ask ourselves is, do we really believe it? Do we really believe that God is sovereign? Do we really believe that Jesus Christ is the king? And if we do, how are we living like it today? How are we living like it right now? You see, at the right time, that, that's, that's what the word means. Right, The word used for time here is, is the word kairos. And it means at the most opportune moment, at the right time, so at the right time, at the most opportune moment, Jesus came and he declared that his kingdom has come. But not only that, it gets better, right? Jesus was saying that he is the king and that the kingdom of God is at hand because he was there, right? That he brought the kingdom with him. See, when Jesus came, he ushered in the beginning of his eternal rule and his eternal reign over all creation. The kingdom of God made its appearance in the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And it was when he came that he started the process of making all things new. But Jesus goes on to, to proclaim. He, he proclaims the coming of his kingdom, but then he said, repent and believe in the gospel. See, when we hear the good news, we have to respond to it. And when we, we respond by either believing it to be true or by rejecting it altogether. And if we truly believe in it, if we truly believe that the gospel is true, and we truly embrace it, we have to let it define us. We have to let it change the way that we think. We have to let it change the way that we see things. And we have to let it change the way that we see people. We have to let it change our identity. That's what repentance is, right? It's a decisive change. It's just a turning away from something and going towards something else. And so if Jesus Christ is the true king, we are invited to turn from any hope that we might find or any fears that we might have from the king, uh, the kings of our own making or the kings of our own choosing, right? The kings that we want to rule our lives. See, we're invited, Jesus in this moment, we're invited to believe and believing is a turning towards something. Here's how, here's how this works, right? If we're turning away from one thing, so let's say we're going a certain direction, we turn away from that by default, right? We're turning towards something else. We're turning and, and, and moving in a different direction. And so in this case, right, repentance and belief uh, go hand in hand. You cannot have one without the other. So we were to repent and believe. See, a definitive change in my heart leads to a definitive change of my life. Uh, that's that's the, the reality that Jesus is presenting. When we change our heart, when he changes our heart, our life will change with it. So when you and I submit to the truth of Jesus' message, when we truly believe him, when we believe that he is the king, we repent of our own desire to be king, and we trust that he is the true king. And so this good news that Jesus was proclaiming is that he is the king, and that he is ushering in this kingdom of grace for those who repent and believe in this good news but we have to respond to it, right? We either choose to follow him in all aspects of our life or we don't. 
Jesus goes on to show us this, right? He says in, in verse 16, Passing alongside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, uh, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And what they do immediately, they left their nets and followed him. And going on a little further, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, uh, who were in the boat, mending their nets. And immediately he called to them, and they left their father, Zebedee, in the boat with the hired servants, and they followed him. Right, Mark does a great job uh, keeping the focus of Jesus center stage here. I love that aspect of what Mark does. But Mark makes a point uh, to keep Jesus central because Jesus, our response to Jesus, is all about Jesus. Right, it's not about me. It's not about you. It's about Jesus. Right, it's about uh, making him known. It's about make who he is and what he is doing. Our response to the message of Jesus is a response to the person of Jesus. It's a response that's saying that we are making Jesus the center of our lives over everything else, right? It's, it's us saying that, that we are responding to him because we are committing our life to following him. We're trusting in him. We believe him, not just in him, but we believe him, right? We're, we're putting all of our weight, all of our eggs in that one basket. That's what Jesus is saying here. Uh, and so we follow him. This is the call that Jesus gives us, right? This is the invitation that he gave to Simon and Andrew and to James and to John. It's the invitation that he gives to us, too, to follow him and to become fishers of men. See, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, I think, said it best. He says, when Christ calls a man, he bids him to come and die. See, following Jesus isn't an invitation that is saying that he's going to, to heal all of our hurts and, and heal all of our pains. Right? It's not an invitation to, to health and wealth either. Following Jesus right, is an invitation to suffer as he has suffered, and an invitation to die to ourselves daily. Right? It's an invitation that makes sacrifices for the advancement of his kingdom and his glory. So following Jesus is us saying, Jesus, it's all about you. Right? The most beautiful part of the calling of Jesus is who he chose to call. Right? He didn't choose the most qualified. He didn't choose the most righteous. He didn't choose the best of the best. He chose the most, the, the least likely of people uh, on the planet to follow him and to carry out his mission. Right? These men, these fishermen, right, they responded not because of who they were. They responded because of who he is. And so what does this mean for us? One, it means we surrender. Right? We submit his authority to his word, and to his, to his uh, ultimate authority in our lives. And then once we surrender, we obey, right? We seek out opportunities to follow in obedience to him in every aspect of our lives. And then we remain loyal to him, right? We give our allegiance to him. Our allegiance on this planet as followers of Christ isn't to a political party or an agenda, right? It's to a person of Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus Christ. That's what our allegiance is belongs to. And so, right, when we hear the gospel mes message of Jesus Christ, we cannot remain neutral, right? We have to make a choice. We have to make Christ the center of our lives and follow him.